In this lecture, we're going to look at the cell division process of meiosis. Right, last time we looked at mitosis, in which we get a single cell producing two daughter cells that are identical to that original parent. In looking at meiosis, we're going to be considering the types of cells that are produced for sexual reproduction to occur. Right, so we'll be looking at this meiotic process. Now, recall we talked briefly about um, the pangenesis concept versus the germplasm theory um, in the first lecture of class. And that pangenesis concept was an early idea of reproduction in which it was thought that at the time of um, conception or at the time of reproduction, right, information was passed from all over an individual's body, right, um, to the gametes, and that that information then was passed on to the zygote that was produced. Right. We now have much better understanding of the reproductive process, and we know that the germplasm theory, that um, the germline tissue in the reproductive organs, right, those tissues that go through divisions um, for producing the gametes, contain a complete set of genetic information. Right? That genetic information is transferred directly to the sperm and to the egg, and those unite to form um, the diploid zygote. Right? So our sperm and egg are haploid, and the zygote is diploid, as is each adult individual. Right? So in the meiotic process, we have to go from diploid cells to haploid cells right, so that when the egg and sperm unite we restore that diploid constitution of chromosomes. Right, so we're going to look at this process by which we go from um, diploid cells to haploid cells. Right, so this is where meiosis would occur and meiosis. So for sexual reproduction to occur, we're considering the two um, main processes of meiosis and fertilization. Okay? And sexual reproduction, the meiotic process, and fertilization together result in um, genetic variation. And so where in mitosis, we get daughter cells that are identical to the parent cell from which they're derived. That's not the case with meiosis. In this case, we end up with um, daughter cells that are genetically different from the parent cell that they were derived from. Right, meiosis results in halving of the chromosome number, making these gametes. Right, as I said before, we're going from diploid to haploid, right, and this happens through two different divisions. In meiosis one, those homologous pairs that make up a diploid organism right, are um, separated from each other. So, that was one homologous pair, and in the first division, we've separated those homologs from each other. Similarly, we've got this homologous pair, and in that first division, we separate them. It is in meiosis one that we go from diploid to haploid. Right? We've divided the number of chromosomes in half, okay? and there's just one complete set of chromosomes in each of those cells. Those chromosomes are still in the replicated state, right? so we still have sister chromatids here. Right? Those are still sister chromatids, right? but the number of chromosomes has been halved. It is in meiosis II that we get the separation of sister chromatids from each other, but notice that going from the end of meiosis I to the end of meiosis II, the cells stay haploid. Right, here we have two chromosomes in this cell. We end up with two chromosomes in those cells where we started with four. Okay. So the first division of meiosis one is referred to as the reduction division because that's where we go from diploid to haploid. And then um, going from meiosis one to meiosis two, right, we get the equational division in meiosis two where we stay the same in haploid to haploid. A fertilization, as we said before, is going to restore the diploid number. So if we have egg and sperm that are produced here, and each one is haploid, if those come together in fertilization, then we restore that diploid number. 
Now thinking about um, what's happening in this meiotic process is that if we have, this is looking at chromosome number 12 here in a homologous pair, this homologous pair carries a gene A, right? This chromosome has allele A on it, and this one has allele little a. The meiotic process is going to separate those homologous chromosomes from each other so that a gamete only receives one of those chromosome number 12s. And so that gamete will contain either um, a chromosome that has big A allele at that gene or the little a allele at that gene. All right, so what are the stages of meiosis? Well, it's important to remember that interphase occurs just like it does in mitosis. That is, before anything happens with the nuclear division for meiosis, the three stages of interphase have to occur first. All right, so we still have G1, S, and G2. Okay, so those all happen before moving into prophase one of meiosis. So our book starts by describing the middle of prophase one. Right, prophase one in general is going to have the same characteristics as in mitosis where we start to see the condensation of the chromosomes into visible form. Um, the centrosomes are forming the mitotic spindle and the nuclear envelope is starting to uh, disintegrate just a little bit. You know, one of the things that we differentiate in meiosis is that prophase one has a, an important event that occurs in it. Okay? And so we break up um, prophase one into early, middle, and late prophase one. Okay? So what we've just described is really the middle prophase one. And then late prophase one is when we have the significant event of crossing over that occurs. Right? And prophase one, late prophase one, is actually divided into five substages that we'll talk about in just a bit. Okay. But the important events that occur are the pairing of homologous chromosomes. Okay, so the homologous chromosomes actually come together, and this occurs in a process called synapsis. Right. So synapsis is the pairing of the homologous chromosomes. Right. So you see they've lined up together. Okay, so once synapsis has occurred, this is the same slide as before, then crossing over occurs. And crossing over is when we actually have the physical exchange of chromosomal material between two chromatids. And this is of non-sister chromatids of a homologous pair. The physical exchange of those non-sister chromatids appear physically as chiasmata, and chiasmata are these locations, let me see that, this location here and this location here, where those non-sister chromatids of the homologous pair are physically linked together. Okay, so we get an exchange of genetic material between those, and they stay physically linked. This is important for ensuring the proper migration of homologous pairs to the metaphase plate stage. Okay. So we see those chiasmata, and we're in late prophase one. What will happen is these mitotic spindle fibers are going to come in and hook to the kinetochores right, of the homologous pair, and it's going to move this whole homologous pair to the metaphase plate. Okay. So you can see this homologous pair is aligned to the metaphase plate and is this one. So this stage of metaphase one is really different from mitosis. If you recall in mitosis, all each chromosome is lined up at the metaphase plate and then sister chromatids separate. In meiosis one, here in this metaphase, we've got the homologous chromosomes are aligned. 
right? That's the first step. Then you see where these are attached to the kinetic ores, okay? And we're going to have the separation of those homologous pairs from each other during anaphase one. Okay. And so if we look at that separation as those microtubules start to shorten, then the homologous pairs um, are released from each other and we get the migration of one chromosome this direction right, and the other one this direction. Now notice that crossing over event has caused these non-sister chromatids to um, exchange genetic information such that this chromatid right, has both blue and red on it as does this one. So those have become genetically different from if I can get another color from these outer chromatids right, where that one is solid blue and the other one is solid red that indicates that there has been a, a genetic difference that has occurred on those chromatids where the crossover took place right. so those sister chromatids are not genetically identical to each other anymore right. this is one of the ways in which genetic variation is generated during meiosis. Okay. So as those homologous pairs migrate to the opposite poles, okay, then we'll move into telophase one where we'll get the reforming of the nuclear envelope okay, um, and the, we'll in many cases we'll get cytokinesis that occurs at the end of telophase one so that those homologous pairs that have been separated are now in separate cells. Okay. So we have gone from, right, this is a diploid cell, there are two copies of every chromosome, to the end of telophase, these are haploid. Right? Because this set is here and this set is here. So there's only one complete set in each cell. As we move into meiosis two, now this is the stage where in each of those new um, haploid cells that have been formed, we'll get the separation of sister chromatids. So those have not separated yet. Right, so prophase two, we'll get that same um, condensing of the chromatin so that the chromosomes are visible. Um, so they recondense in Metaphase two will have those spindle fibers will be attached to the kinetic cores of each chromosome now, right? and those will line up at the metaphase plate. Here they're calling it the equatorial plate, but it's the same thing as the metaphase plate. Okay? And so what will happen in anaphase two is those sister chromatids from each other, right? and we'll have each of those chromatids being pulled to the opposite poles. And then telophase two, the reforming of the nuclear envelope, the decondensing of the chromosomes, and that's followed by cytokinesis, where those um, cells are eventually divided from each other. Okay, so if we were to actually take a look at the um, end products, what those chromosomes look like at the end of telophase two, Right, what we'll see are four genetically different haploid cells. Okay. And if we compare those to the original parent cell, right, the original parent cell, even before um, synthesis, it would have had one big red chromosome, and one little red chromosome, and then the homologs for each of those there would have been one big blue and one little blue chromosome. Right, so this would have been a diploid cell where you've got this homologous pair right, and this homologous pair, so two sets of those chromosomes. Now if we look at the genetic products that have been produced this one only has two chromosomes that happen to get both blue. Um, this one got both red. This cell 
got, and so did this one, I think got those chromatids that were the results of crossing over events. So this shows all of those stages together. Right, where we've got meiosis 1 going from middle prophase 1 to late prophase 1. Remember that in late prophase 1 we have synapsis, the pairing of those homologous chromosomes, followed by crossing over and the formation of the chiasmata, which are the visible um, places where crossing over has occurred. And you, um, in metaphase 1, we'll have the alignment of homologous pairs at the metaphase plate, and in anaphase 1, homologous pairs split from each other. So at the end of telophase 1, both of those cells are haploid, where we started off as diploid there. And in meiosis 2, we'll end up getting the separation of sister chromatids in those new haploid cells. And so these are still haploid, but now we're going to get sister chromatids Right, separating from each other, okay, and get that end result of four haploid cells that are all genetically different from each other and from that original parent cell. Okay, so table 2.2 summarizes the major events in each of those stages of meiosis. Right, we have meiosis 1 here and meiosis 2 here. One of the things that I forgot to mention before is um, in between cytokinesis of meiosis 1 and the beginning of meiosis 2, in some cells there is this stage called interkinesis, and in that interkinesis you'll get um, kind of the, the, the breakdown of the mitotic spindle, chromosomes decondensing, um, nuclear envelope reforming, but then the cell will move into meiosis 2. Um, there is no interphase that happens in between per se in that there's no DNA synthesis that occurs again. And that would kind of defeat the purpose of, of the whole process of meiosis. So um, that's an important step to recognize that happens in some cells. Okay. For practice, I would recommend that you make a table for a cell that's going through meiosis like that of table 2.12 that I did in the last lecture um, that tracks the number of DNA molecules, um, i.e. chromatids, okay, and the number of chromosomes per cell as you go through each of the phases of meiosis 1. Okay, meiosis, if we recall, said that at the beginning that meiosis creates genetic variation. Meiosis and, and sexual reproduction or fertilization do. Um, mitosis does not create genetic variation. It does not make cells that are genetically different from each other. So the creation of genetic variation can happen in two ways. One we have already talked about a little bit, which is crossing over that occurs in late prophase 1, that recombination of alleles. That is, you're getting parts of a blue chromatid with parts of a red chromatid that gives us a new combination of alleles along the length of the chromosome. Okay, the other way that it can happen is the random distribution of chromosomes due to random alignment in metaphase 1. Okay, so let's talk about each of these. Right, this figure that we're looking at is crossing over in late prophase 1. And late prophase 1 has been divided into five separate substages. Okay, these five substages are leptotene, zygotene, pacotene, diplotene, and diakinesis. Okay. So in leptotene, this is going to be the very beginning of late prophase 1, where we're really seeing those chromosomes condensing. Um, the nuclear envelope is starting to break down a little bit. Okay. In zygotene, you can see that um, the further condensing is actually occurring, but this is where the chromosomes are actually pairing. So it's in zygotene that we have synapsis. Right, and recall synapsis is the pairing of the homologous chromosomes. Okay. Followed by synapsis is the formation of this protein complex along the length of the arms of the homologous pair. Okay, so I think of it like this. If I were to draw this is, I'm drawing horizontally one chromosome. So this is a, the centromere that's holding sister chromatids together. So each of these are sister chromatids. And then, um, 
change colors and this is the other chromosome of the homologous pair and its sister chromatids. Okay, and the synaptominal complex is this protein complex that's formed all the way along the length of those non-sister chromatids of the homologous pair. Okay, and then crossing over can actually occur anywhere along that length. Right, so we could say that crossing over happens there and there. Okay. <clears throat> crossing over will occur at least one time per homologous pair. Right, and this happens, um, one, for the insurance of, of creating genetic variation, but also making sure that the homologous pair moves to the metaphase plate correctly, right? because what happens after the crossing over is that at the places where crossing over has occurred, we actually have the chiasmata, and those chiasmata are those physical attachments right, where crossing over has happened, and so that ensures that as this... Um, pair moves to the metaphase plate that they actually stay together and then segregate properly. Okay. So it's in diplotene that the chiasmata are actually visible. Okay. And then in diakinesis, the chromosomes condense even further and you can really see those chiasmata being present. Okay. So even though we have this kind of general order of you know, synapsis, the pairing of the homologs followed by the formation of the synaptominal complex um, where crossing over will occur followed by the visible chiasmata crossing over truly can occur in either of these three stages of zygotene, pacotene, or diplotene. And so even though it seems like it really should happen only in pacotene evidence um, has shown that it actually occurs in these other stages on occasion as well. Right, so that's what we're looking at if we start with the pairing of homologs that occurs in zygotene. Right, and then those chiasmata are visible by the end of diplotene. And really to see them this condensed would probably be in diakinesis. And from diakinesis then we'd move into metaphase one. Okay, so crossing over that happens in late prophase 1 leads to genetic variation by recombining the alleles of different genes that are on the same chromosome. Okay, so to really understand how this works, we need to take a look at the, the organization of genes along the length of a chromosome. Right, so we're looking at an individual here where we've just got this one pair of homologous chromosomes. And those chromosomes carry genes A and B. Okay, so this individual, this individual cell is diploid, and for the A gene, that individual is heterozygous of big A, little a. At the B gene, the individual is also heterozygous of big B, little b. Okay. But notice that we've got um, the big A and big B alleles of those genes on the same chromosome, and the little a and little b alleles on the same chromosome. So DNA synthesis occurs, and we have sister chromatids. Right? The sister chromatids have big A and big B, and then the ones on the blue chromosome have little a and little b. Well, if crossing over occurs, okay, then when it happens somewhere along the length of the chromosome in between genes A and B, notice that we now have a chromosome, a chromatid, that has big A and big B. It's just like the original um, parental one. Okay, but we also now have this little a, big B combination right, that occurs right here. Okay, that's something new. We haven't seen that before in the parents. Right, so that is the result of recombination. Right, crossing over created that. Okay, if we look at the blue chromosome, Right, we've got that little a, little b, 
A. And that little a, little b we saw over here in that parental um, cell type. Okay, but we also have big A, little b. Okay, and that is also the result of recombination. Okay. So when those sister chromatids separate during meiosis 2, well, in meiosis 1 the homologous pairs will separate, then in meiosis 2 the sister chromatids separate, the resulting haploid gametes right, are all going to be genetically different from each other. You have one that has a big A, big B allele at those different genes, one that has a little a, big B, one that's big A, little b, and little a, little b. All right, so four genetically different gametes have been produced. Okay, so the first way genetic variation is created is by crossing over. The second way that it is created is by alternate arrangements of homologous chromosomes in metaphase 1. There is a whole lot going on in this slide, so we'll try to work through it um, slowly here so you can see what's going on. Now let's look at this first um, cell. Okay? This first cell is diploid, with 2n being equal to 6. Okay, so that means there are three homologous pairs. Okay? These two are homologous, that's homologous, and that's homologous. Okay? So each of those homologous pairs has represented by a different Roman numeral. Okay, so we've got homologous pair 1, homologous pair 2, homologous pair 3. And the M represents that it came from the maternal parent. The P represents that it came from the paternal parent. Okay. After DNA replication occurs, then we have all those sister chromatids, which are visible here. Okay, and then in metaphase 1, this is metaphase 1. These are homologous pairs are going to line up at the metaphase plate. Okay? Well, one way that they can align is that all of the maternal chromosomes are on one side of the metaphase plate and all of the paternals are on one side of the metaphase plate. Okay? We're not even going to consider crossing over here yet. Um, but if these all separate from each other, these will be the resulting gametes. Right? So we've got all red together, all blue together. So in that type of segregation, you get all these maternal chromosomes and all the paternals. But it could be that they line up differently at the metaphase plate. We could get for chromosome 1, the maternal on this side, and for chromosome 2, the maternal on this side. But chromosome 3, they get switched so that the paternal's on this side. Okay. Well, in that case, then we end up with gametes that are genetically different. This one has two reds and a blue, this one has two blues and a red. And so we now have genetically different gametes here than we had from that arrangement. Okay. Third option would be maternal chromosome number one with paternal chromosomes two and three. That leads to a whole different set of chromosomal arrangements as does this one. Right, so we see that the way in which those chromosomes actually line up, the homologous pairs line up at the metaphase plate during metaphase 1, can lead to genetic variation among those gametes. Okay. In general, the rule here is that we have 2n possible combinations of gametes, where n is our number of chromosome pairs. Right, so in humans, n is equal to 23, so, okay, this didn't actually work. Um, what we need, this is actually 2 to the n combinations of gametes, okay, where n is the number of chromosome pairs. Okay, and this, so this should be 2 raised to the 23rd. So that is over 8 million different possible combinations of chromosomes in the gametes. So even without crossing over being considered at all, one individual, human, can make over 8 million different, genetically different gametes. Okay? If you throw a crossing over in there, then um, there are innumerable ways to actually make different gametes. Okay, another thing that we want to take a look at, um, it's a question for meiotic division, is what holds sister chromatids and what holds homologous pairs together? Right, and 
if homologous pairs separate in meiosis 1, why don't sister chromatids also separate in meiosis 1? What holds them together all the way through the process until meiosis 2? And if we look at mitosis, sister chromatids just separate from each other right away. So why don't they separate right away from each other in meiosis? Okay, well, the answer has to come comes from the presence of this particular protein called cohesin. Okay, and we'll just look at my, mitosis first. Okay, so cohesin okay, is this uh, molecule that is produced during the S phase, right, during synthesis. Okay, that is present along the length of sister chromatids and especially at the centromere region that holds sister chromatids together through G2 prophase and metaphase. Okay. And that cohesin is broken down at the beginning of anaphase by an enzyme called separase. Now, remember the spindle assembly checkpoint that occurs at the end of metaphase and mitosis? Right? Well, separase is produced once that checkpoint is passed. Right? So it's not until that checkpoint is passed that we get separase being produced. That breaks down the cohesin. That allows sister chromatids to separate from each other. Okay. Well, what about in meiosis? In meiosis, there is a meiosis-specific cohesin. Okay. And you can see that cohesin is present along the length of the sister chromatids. Right, so all of this. Okay. But it's also present at each chiasma. Okay. So it's actually what's holding those homologous pairs together right, as the chiasmata. So I'll just make a quick note here. Chiasma is singular. Chiasmata is plural. So we have a cohesin all the way along those lengths. Right? Well, we know that in anaphase, we should get the breakdown of cohesin, okay? which does actually occur in anaphase 1. Okay? That allows for homologous pairs, because of the breakdown of the cohesin at the chiasmata, Right, to separate from each other. Right? But notice that sister chromatids still stay together. Well, this cohesin is breaking down right here, okay? right, but this is not. At the centromeres, those sister chromatids are staying together. Okay? That is because of the presence of this protein called shigoshin. Okay? So shigoshin is complexed with cohesin, at those um, centromeres. Okay. That prevents separase from being able to break down um, the cohesin at the centromeres during anaphase 1. Okay. After the homologous pairs separate from each other, then shigoshin is broken down, or shigoshin is degraded, I should say. So as it moves into, as the cell moves into meiosis 2, the cohesin that is present at the centromere is no longer protected by shigoshin. So as we move through prophase 1, meta, or excuse me, prophase 2, metaphase 2, um, then as we move into anaphase 2, that cohesin can be broken down by separase again. Okay, because the shigoshin um, was degraded during meiosis 1, after the homologous pairs had separated. Okay, we've taken a look at um, how meiosis occurs, the details of meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. We've looked at the generation of genetic variation via crossing over and random alignment of the chromosomes in metaphase 1. And we've looked at what happens to keep um, homologous pairs together, how they separate, and how sister chromatids separate in meiosis 1 and subsequently meiosis 2.
Okay, what we're going to look at next are some of the specifics of how meiosis in, occurs in animals and how gametes form, and then we'll also look at um, the general formation of gametes in plants. Now, normally we think of, you know, one cell going through meiosis and it produces four haploid cells that are genetically different from the parent cell. Well, that's true, right? but in both animals and plants it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, and there are other cell divisions that have to occur in order for gametes to fully form and mature. Okay, so we're full, we'll first look at um, gamete production in animals using humans as the example. Okay, so we're looking at this process called gametogenesis. In general, gametogenesis just means the process by which gametes are formed. So in males, this is called spermatogenesis. Okay. So within the testes, there are um, diploid cells called spermatogonia. Okay. In each spermatogonium, the singular of spermatogonia, we can see that um, cell entering prophase one. Okay? If it enters prophase one, it is then called a primary spermatocyte. That primary spermatocyte it is diploid. Okay? So here it's from this primary spermatocyte. That spermatocyte is what's going to um, go through all of or produce the products that go through all of meiosis. Okay? So each primary spermatocyte, which is diploid, completes meiosis 1. Remember that meiosis 1, we go from diploid to haploid. So this re results in the production of two secondary spermatocytes. Those are haploid. Okay? The secondary spermatocytes then undergo meiosis 2 right, to produce four spermatotids, and these spermatotids are also haploid, and they mature into sperm, which are haploid. Okay. So in this case, right, we actually have, so our primary spermatocyte undergoes meiosis 1, which produces secondary spermatocytes. They go through meiosis 2, and we get the production of our spermatids, which mature into sperm. Right. That's pretty straightforward. That's what we would expect to see with those two meiotic divisions. Okay. In females, things are a little bit different. Gametogenesis in females is referred to as oogenesis. Okay. And there are the presence of these cells called oogonia in the ovaries. Okay. Each oogonium, which is diploid, will enter into prophase 1, becoming a primary oocyte. Okay. So a primary oocyte is diploid. It started that, pri that um, prophase 1 stage, and so we'll move through um, the rest of meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Okay, so each primary oocyte completes meiosis 1, and the products of that right, are these two haploid cells, but these are different from each other. Okay, one of them is this large cell called a secondary oocyte, which is haploid. The other is a small one called the first polar body. Okay, the first polar body actually disintegrates, okay, so it doesn't go on to do any more divisions. Okay. It's the one secondary oocyte that will complete meiosis II. Okay. So when it divides, it will produce two cells in meiosis II, the ovum, which is haploid, and a second polar body. This one also disintegrates. Okay. And so at that point, the ovum is what will actually get fertilized right, by the sperm cell. So in males, four sperm are produced per meiotic event, whereas in females, only one ovum is produced per meiotic event right, from that one primary oocyte. The rest of these things actually degrade. One of the other interesting things about spermatogenesis and oogenesis is that for males, spermatogenesis happens continually after a male reaches um, puberty. It, so these sperm cells are being uh, produced new from spermatogonia. A female, on the other hand, um, is born with all of the primary oocytes that she's ever going to have. Right? These 
even while the fetus is developing in its mother's wombs, these primary oocytes are being produced. Okay. They stall at this prophase 1 stage okay, and don't complete meiosis until um, later stages in the reproductive cycle. At the time of ovulation, a secondary oocyte is what is released from the ovule. Right, so during ovulation, we get meiosis 1 being completed, okay, and then it's not until the point of fertilization where meiosis 2 actually occurs. Okay, so if meiosis 2 doesn't occur until um, that point of fertilization, you could have cells that are, you know, if a woman is 30 years old when she actually um, conceives, right, that egg is 30-some years old. If she's 40, then that egg is 40-some years old, okay? and it's been there since before she was born. If this is one of the reasons why we often see eggs being um, you know, responsible for or, or genetic problems arising because of problems that occur during cell division um, in the mother, and that's why maternal age often influences the risk of inheriting a genetic disease such as trisomy 21. And all of those cells are much older. All of the um, machinery in those cells is older, and so there's a higher chance of things going wrong during that meiotic cell division process. So when we end up with an extra chromosome in a cell, Right? there's a higher chance of that happening the older that egg cell is. Okay, in plants, um, it was, you know, the same process of, of meiosis actually occurs, um, but plants have an interesting life cycle in that um, they, they spend their, well, many plants, um, spend their life as what's referred to as a sporophyte, in the sporophyte, just like in humans, um, the, a mature human adult is diploid, right? All those cells are diploid. Okay. Within the sporophyte, there are specialized cells um, that will go through meiosis, okay? And the result of meiosis are these haploid spores, so those are 1N. The haploid spores grow up into a, a haploid organism called a gametophyte, okay? and that gametophyte will produce gametes via mitosis. Right? So here we have an egg cell and a sperm cell that are produced from mitotic divisions that happen in the gametophyte. Okay? So my, meiosis in plants does not directly produce gametes. Instead, meiosis produces spores. Those spores go through mitosis and eventually produce gametes. Okay, so I think that it does it for the rest of Chapter 2. So be ready to um, discuss these different um, processes of meiosis. Um, and both spermatogenesis and oogenesis um, and in lecture.